This is the Wisdom Podcast. Welcome to the Wisdom Podcast. My name is Daniel Aiken, and for this episode, I caught up with Christina Feldman, who was teaching a retreat at IMS, the Insight Meditation Society. Christina is an IMS guiding teacher. She's also a co founder of Gaia House in England and has been teaching Insight Meditation retreats since 1976. In this episode, Christina talks about some of the common words that come up during Buddhist teachings, like renunciation, mindfulness, and suffering. And she digs into the ideas behind these words and suggests that there might be other words that better represent these ideas. So we end up having quite a wide-ranging conversation, which I hope you enjoy. Thank you for joining us on the Wisdom Podcast. It's a pleasure to have you on. And we're here at IMS, and you're um, conducting a retreat for a number of people here. I saw the car park was packed, so it must, the hall must also be packed. And I was just wondering about um, the theme of the retreat and who comes to these retreats. This retreat in particular has quite a specific theme and in a way a specific format because it's primarily offered for people who are somehow trained in and offering mindfulness-based interventions in their professional lives. So it, it has a twofold process or a twofold um, direction. One aspect is it gives people the opportunity to deepen their own practice and their own understanding of what this rather generic word mindfulness actually Mm. means and what it means to embody mindfulness. So there's a very personal dimension to it. And as mindfulness-based interventions are developing in the West, alongside that is the introduction of certain competency guidelines Mm -hmm. um, that have been adopted by many training organizations. And these competency guidelines recognize the importance of having a depth of personal practice and understanding. Mm -hmm. So it's actually becoming increasingly a requirement for people who are training in mindfulness-based applications to uh, take a retreat, sit a retreat annually. So it offers that dimension, but the second dimension of this retreat is really... um, more fully exploring the understanding of mindfulness from a classical perspective of what this means, the effect it has on psychological well-being. So it does bring in a genuine contemplation of some of the early texts that speak in in a very fulsome way about how mindfulness plays a part in liberation. Mm -hmm. And so the the retreat uh, emphasizes those two themes. So most people on this retreat are in some capacity using mindfulness in their jobs, whether they're social workers or psychologists or educators or working in the justice system. Um, they're being asked to and being trained to incorporate mindfulness in their clinical work or in their workplace. Um, So it's it's, it's really quite a different body of people in many ways from many retreats because it's not a kind of more generalized trying to figure out what meditation practice is. It it has a, a very specific focus and theme that gets really um, conveyed both in how we approach giving the instructions and the kind of Dharma talks that we offer on this retreat. So these people are teaching mindfulness to clients or are are they doing mind are they using mindfulness in their own practice or both? Both but the majority will be teaching uh, mindfulness based applications in their workplace. And as part of the qualifications to do that it's becoming sort of uh, understood that their own personal practice and retreats 
are an important component to being able to do that effectively. I think increasingly it's understood that mm-hmm. mindfulness is not just a, a set of techniques that we yeah. deliver to others, that mm-hmm. um, for it to be meaningfully offered to clients, uh, there's a genuine embodied aspect of it that can actually only really be learned mm-hmm. in the context of their own inner exploration and the development of their own practice. Yeah. And so in this context, what does mindfulness mean? Because it's it's so ubiquitous now this word, and it's taking on it's it's a, a label that's used to refer to a various types of practices. And so in this context, when we use the word mindfulness, it might be helpful to define that. It is a ubiquitous word, and it has been ever since the first texts were translated. Mm-hmm. I mean, the first person to uh, actually translate this Pali word sati. Yeah into the English word mindfulness mm-hmm. was Rice Davids in, mm-hmm. in the 18th century. And uh, what text was he? He was like? translating the early Pali yeah, canon. Yeah. The early, uh, and, and so it seemed that he, it appears that he struggled to find an adequate word mm-hmm. to translate sati. Mm-hmm. And mindfulness was what he ended up with, which in my understanding was a word he actually borrowed from the Gospels. Mm-hmm. Okay. For for lack of a, a better word, yeah. but of course the way it is used now is a, it's a kind of catchword. It it mm. becomes a bit cliched. Yeah. Um, and so there there is a, a great value in actually looking at this Pali word sati mm. and exploring how it was used in the early texts and the yeah. nuances of sati which involve far more than just paying attention Mm -hmm. you know and of course one of the texts that most primarily employs or focuses on this word sati is the satipatthana sutta or the four ways of establishing mindfulness Mm -hmm. and in that discourse uh, the buddha quite specifically contextualizes mindfulness almost as an embarkation point for insight Mm -hmm. Um, but as an embarkation point for insight, it has many dimensions which are easily overlooked when it becomes a cliched word. Mm-hmm. And part of the offering of this retreat is to explore those nuances mm-hmm. of what, what do we actually understand by, by mindfulness. Mm-hmm. You know, and sometimes my, I almost have a, have a wish that this word had never actually been incorporated. Do you have a preferred translation for sati? Well, again, you know, over millennia, people have struggled mm-hmm. to find the right translation mm-hmm. for sati. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think from the Pali, the, the, probably the most accurate translation would be a present moment collectedness mm-hmm. or a present moment recollection. Mm-hmm. Um, recollection. Yeah, a present moment recollection. Originally, sati had this nuance of remembering. Yeah, so Sanskrit smriti. Yes, yeah, smriti. But rather, the Buddha shifted mm. uh, how that word was used. So rather than a historical remembering mm-hmm. of data or information, it was a remembering of the present moment. Mm-hmm. But then also within... You know, if you look at some of the imagery from the early texts that is associated with this word sati, it basically has four different dimensions. Mm. And one of them is developing what we might call a simple awareness or a simple knowing, just mm. that knowing of a thought is a thought, a sound is a sound, knowing where we are, knowing what is going on within us. Um, part of the or one of the nuances of sati has this uh, sense of investigation yeah. to understand the process of what is being experienced, to understand that experientially the the uh, image that's often used is of a, a surgeon operating mm. on a wound that they wouldn't yeah. blindly jump in. They would yeah. determine the source of the wound, the cause of the wound, the prog- the diagnosis, the prognosis. Um, part of sati is uh, reframing cognition, mm-hmm. reframing our views of how our, our perceptions of how we're seeing the world on a moment to moment that gets so easily distorted mm-hmm. by 
um, historical memory, a yeah. historical association. And part of sati has this, this nuance of being a protective awareness. It's mm-hmm. protecting the mind from the the surges of of impulse, of reactivity, of habit patterns that erode well being. Mm-hmm. So you know, if you if you read much of the contemporary literature, and if you read some of the more historical literature, of course you you come across this multitude of yeah. of uh, definitions, mm-hmm. and it's hard to capture in any one of them yeah. all of those nuances of what is meant That's by right. sati. I wanted to talk about the the word words present moment, and it feels to me that present moment is too abstract. So when you look at the text and what they're talking about, they talk about sounds or like there's an object, right? So how can you take the present moment as an object? It's really an abstract thing. And so underlying that, you have to rely on, like we don't have a sense that picks up present moment, for example. Mm-hmm. So does it feels to me that present moment has to be linked with something, whether it be thoughts, sounds, vision, And I just wanted your thoughts on that comment. I mean, again, it's one of those phrases that becomes thrown around like some sort of catch-all cliche, you know, just be present. And it's it's very much, uh, I think, subject to misinterpretation. Mm -hmm. Um, People imagine that if I'm really present, I don't have thoughts about the past or I don't have thoughts about the future Mm -hmm. as if it's some sort of abstracted reality which is disconnected of course from the entire spectrum of our lives which includes past future thoughts present moment i think really refers to what is actually occurring just now Mm -hmm. and that's a very wide spectrum of experience Mm -hmm. my body is touching the ground my i am living in a much wider reality than my personal experience Mm -hmm. um the thoughts arising, I'm speaking, the sensations happening in the body, I'm aware of you, I'm aware of the room around me. So it's about what is actually occurring just now, but it also includes how I'm relating to what is actually occurring yeah. to right now. So it includes this inner world of experience of whether I'm liking or disliking or distorting mm-hmm. or seeing clearly and the use of sati as a present moment recollection, in a way, is, is a stripping away of the extras. It's a stripping away of the extras of, it's not, it's not suppressing them or trying to get rid of them, but it's not seeing what is occurring right now through the eyes of the extras, of my likes and my dislikes and my preferences and my fears and anxieties. It's being mindful of those, Mm -hmm. but it's actually learning that that all of those preferences and constructions inwardly are presenting me with a distorted view Mm -hmm. of what is occurring right now, which is where the suffering is born. Mm And so sati, bearing in mind, ha, as an embarkation point for understanding and as part of a pathway that leads to liberation, mm-hmm. is directly concerned with understanding the, the architecture of our personal world mm-hmm. and also the architecture, architecture of how suffering and distress is born Mm -hmm. and how it comes to an end within that personal world of the moment. Mm -hmm. You know, because certainly I think in Buddhist psychology, suffering and struggle and torment is not some kind of life sentence or static state. Mm -hmm. It is something that is being created and recreated moment to moment Mm -hmm. through distortion. So sati and as a present moment recollection is directly concerned with bringing to an end the distortions that cause distress. And how does that happen? Like, so sati as a practice, and then, uh, so then you will um, become aware of, you know, not only the objects of your perception, but your feelings and the way you think and the relationship. So this idea and of being aware of that how does that next step into insight 
take place so what would be the next step after you're becoming aware of you know your perceptions and then also your feelings and all the this internal architecture that you talk about how do, how does that actually help us um, um, understanding the distortion how does that help yeah, us yeah well there's, there's a number of different ways and and one of them clearly is, is very practical very applied you know the the Satipatthana speaks about the four ways of establishing mindfulness so it's it's taking unpacking mm-hmm. our experience of the moment and basically putting it into four classrooms mm-hmm. here we contemplate the body we mm-hmm. contemplate the feeling tone we contemplate the moods and the mental states we contemplate process and mm-hmm. phenomena now this contemplation is an informed contemplation so it's not just the the cold glare of attention mm-hmm. when we look at the sutta the F- effect that is encouraged is to contemplate these classrooms with certain uh, uh, an informed view we might say and part of the encouragement of course is to notice the arising and passing Mm -hmm. the changes Mm -hmm. part of the encouragement is to be able to shift into a place of non-identification. Mm-hmm. This is actually not me. It's not my fault. I didn't invite necessarily or choose this experience of the moment. It is born of conditions and 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 change. Part of that informed view is to have that investigative element mm-hmm. of seeing actually how do we how does the mind feed into a world of contractedness and distortion and how is that relinquished mm-hmm. so you know the actual cultivation always needs to be put into the context of bhavana mm-hmm. again which is you know inadequately translated as meditation yeah. um and far more is concerned with the qualities the liberating qualities of mind that are being cultivated mm-hmm in that contemplation and and in that exploration do you have a preferred word for bhavana cultivation cultivation okay and you know i i think again you know it i think it's it it's a better translation but more than that i i think it's a it's a dynamic mm-hmm. translation yeah. you know when people use the word meditation all of the images come to mind that i sit down with mm-hmm. my eyes closed and mm-hmm you know watch mm-hmm. what is going on and i think the translation of bhavana's cultivation is, is actually suggesting a much more engaged and much more dynamic mm-hmm. uh process of what is being cultivated in this moment mm-hmm. um you know bearing in mind that we're we're pretty much always cultivating something either consciously or unconsciously mm-hmm, yeah. and sometimes generally if it's unconscious what we're cultivating are the the kind of familiar habit patterns of a lifetime just enacting yeah. them and reenacting them over mm-hmm, again <laughs> and letting them grow stronger whereas if we move much more into the sense of a conscious cultivation that we we start to inquire well, what is it that actually liberates the mind mm. and it's a a cultivation of 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 wholesome and and liberating qualities that uh, release the stickiness release the the selfing mm-hmm. of the moment so to speak mm-hmm. that we're we're cultivating mindfulness we're cultivating investigation we're cultivating energy and and uh, inquiry we're cultivating calm and for me this feels like a much more intentional way of being but also a much more engaged way of practicing it's mm-hmm. moving into this this sense of awareness that yes every moment something is being practiced mm-hmm. and and what i practice i get better at mm-hmm. you know and if i'm practicing something unconscious and 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 distress creating mm-hmm. i'm actually going to get better at it mm-hmm. and mindfulness is actually you know has that effect really of of illuminating what is going on we might say mm-hmm. so we become much more aware of what is being cultivated what is being practiced moment to moment and you were you use the word liberation and so i'm wondering about like social workers who are at your retreat and using mindfulness and teaching mindfulness in their workplace or to their clients or whoever it may be what does uh, liberation mean in this context well you know 
I mean, this is part of the exploration, isn't it, of the convergence of these worlds, you yeah. know, where, you know, clearly in, in the Buddhist teaching, you know, liberation was really placed at the heart of all that we do, mm. um, awakening, liberating. Mm. Um, and when mindfulness moves into more contemporary settings, you know, mm. Actually, it's not only true, only in contemporary settings. I think about it in the retreat context, mm -hmm. that many people come into retreats and, and their aspirations are generally directly related to what they're, be, what they're experiencing in their lives. Mm -hmm. So if a person comes into a retreat and they're living, you know, a life that's very much governed by conflict or, or, or fear or relational stress, often, you know, that's forming the motivation of why they're coming on a retreat. They, they want to end the suffering of this. And when you think about, you know, mindfulness in schools or mindfulness in a criminal justice system or other contexts, again, people's aspiration for beginning on a path of mindfulness is also directly related frequently to the suffering of the moment. Mm -hmm. Now, in my sense, people's aspirations change through experience. Mm -hmm. You know, people may start with quite a, a, a very defined, and some people might describe it as a limited, but might be a very important sense of aspiration, just mm -hmm. to find a way out of a, of a world governed by a certain element of distress. Mm. And then if people practice well and sincerely, they they may actually discover that that's possible mm. and that that world changes. Mm -hmm. And as that world changes, my sense is that people's aspirations change also. Mm -hmm. If this is possible, maybe also this is possible. Yeah. I mean, it, w it would make no sense in our world today of someone moving into a prison to teach mindfulness practice to say, oh, actually, we're going to talk about liberation, mm -hmm. you know? We're actually going to talk about what's being experienced yeah. right now and how that might be transformed. You know, I think that's, that's very true in most cases. Like most people turning up to a Dharma talk for the first yeah. time. The teachers, if the teacher starts off with, well, Buddha first taught that the truth of suffering, that your life is suffering. Most people answer, no, my life's not suffering. It's okay. And then if you say, well, why are you here? And then the, the answer to that, if they reflect on that, there's some sort of unsatisfactory nature to their life. And that's what the Buddha meant. So I think most people are coming out of not some high aspiration, but just an ability to be able to deal with their own life. So I think that's very true. And that changes over over time. And, you know, personally, I, I would have some unease about saying that the Buddha taught that life is suffering. I mean, again, it's one of those translation problems, isn't it? The Buddha yeah. taught that there's dukkha. Yeah. You know, and, and yeah. dukkha describes that whole spectrum of unease from, you know, physical and psychological torment mm -hmm. to just the the more existential unease mm -hmm. that it it seems that Siddhartha suffered from. You know, mm -hmm. Siddhartha, you know, if we if we refer the, to the young Buddha in that mm -hmm. way, you know, at least in the teaching stories, w was not living in a world that was tormented mm -hmm. and, and anguished, you know. Life was pretty good according to the yeah. stories, or as good as it could be in India yeah. at those times. And it was much more that existential unease or disease that, you know, this comfort, this protection, this degree of pleasure was simply failing to deliver the kind of enduring happiness or peace or freedom of heart that he longed for. Um, and so Dukkha, again, Dukkha really so needs to be understood, which is actually what the yeah. Buddha said. Yeah. <laughs> the dukkha is to be understood. <laughs> <laughs> um, not to uh, imagine them coining that, that phrase, that dukkha really is to be understood. Mm -hmm. So you prefer unease as a translation for dukkha? Un unsatisfactoriness, dis-ease dis even. Yeah. Not at ease. Not that at ease. Even as things are 
as good as conditions can be, yeah. they're going to change. Yeah. There's uncertainty. Yeah. There is death. Yeah, there something. is aging. Yeah. There is illness. There is disappointment. Mm-hmm. Disappointment is mm-hmm. a big one. Yeah. You know, I often think of the stories of the young Buddha as really a, a kind of existential disappointment. Mm-hmm. You know, it just didn't deliver. Yeah. It just didn't deliver. And, yeah. you know, this is so true in our culture and, and in, in, in other cultures. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the, the failure of a kind of promise you know, you become this, you get this, you you make your life like this, and guess what? You're going to be so happy, mm-hmm. maybe for a moment, mm-hmm. or maybe for 10 minutes, or maybe even for a month, yeah. and then guess what? My mind gets hungry again. Yeah. You know, there, there's something lacking. There's mm-hmm. something amiss. There's something not quite complete. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in, in, in our culture, I... You know, given this sort of epidemic of depression and depressive mm-hmm. relapse, mm-hmm. Um, and also in many other cultures, um, I, I sometimes, you know, you look at the triggers for depression, how often it's unexpected loss, mm-hmm. unexpected change, you know, a sort of a, uh, undermining of self-view that was dependent on conditions mm-hmm. being in a certain way um, and how much disappointment features yeah. in all of this and you know somehow that this shouldn't be happening in this way and also there's a sometimes there's a little bit of a coming to terms with the things I thought would make me happy I've lost hope in that yeah, and so where and not having somewhere else to turn for uh, liberation from suffering or some sort of just some ease uh, is is quite could be quite depressing actually. It could be depressing, or it could be a real turning point in mm. people's lives. I often think of disappointment as a, as a kind of crossroads. Mm. You know that coming to those realizations that mm. things don't satisfy the way that they used to, or mm. that you know my reliance on the world of conditions for happiness didn't quite work out. Mm. Yeah, that could be absolutely a real uh, route into a profound depression. Mm. Exactly the same experience can be a turning point, which Mm. it seems to be from not only the teaching story of the Buddha, but for many people. Mm -hmm. This is actually when they start to inquire. This is when they start to investigate rather than blaming themselves or blaming the world of conditions they actually start to look well where is the source of happiness you know where is the source of a enduring well-being you know where where do i turn do i you know in 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 feeling disappointed do i become very busy in my life doing more rearrangement of conditions more pursuit of status or possessions or do i think oh this is a moment to wake up mm-hmm. You know, maybe there's another place to turn, which is actually the sort of uh, the refuge of, of of understanding, of putting down my my arguments with the unarguables, mm-hmm. of actually um, looking to the potentiality of my own mind, of my own heart, for really profound and remarkable sense of ease and peace and freedom mm-hmm. and non-identification and compassion and care and mm-hmm. and engagement and embodiment that quality of wakefulness that can be born within mm-hmm. and so that quality of wakefulness what are the practices that p- people can do to help inspire that or what what do you do i know people like to hear about what teachers do like what are you? What's your meditation look like? What are you doing? Meditation look like uh, that depends a lot. Yeah. You know, I mean, if I'm in a situation in my life where there's, you know, perhaps a lot of of difficulty or, or trauma going on, say in my family or um, or in institutions, for example, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> institutional <laughs> angst. <laughs> Um, institutional, you know, relational disease, institutional disease. Um, I'm very aware that that's a time when uh, when I need to 
protect my mind from proliferation. Mm-hmm. How do you do so that? So <laughs> I, I, I know I don't need to be a participant in deepening the disease. Yeah. I know I have that option. Mm-hmm. And, um, and there's, there's a number of different, you know, we have a wealth of practices available to us to mm-hmm. teach us how to uh, teach us how to protect the mind from proliferation mm-hmm. you know they're very applied practices i mean i may use uh, meta practice in that mm-hmm. way you know i may use concentration practices in that way not as a way of avoiding what's going on mm-hmm. but of not being an unconscious contributor to disease through my own proliferation mm-hmm. or, or or unease within myself. So that's actually very helpful. Mm-hmm. It's actually very helpful. I mean, recently I was um, looking after my my uh, little baby grandson, you know, who 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 was born quite unwell and, and he had a pretty rocky start in in his in his first months, you know. So, you know, there was a lot of um, obviously, you know, worry and anxiety and, you know, apprehension around. And sometimes, it, you know, it was never more clear to me that this was a time to protect my mind from proliferation. Yeah. And, you know, concentration practices are, are guarding the mind, guarding the well-being of the mind, can take many, many different forms. Yes. You know, I mean, sometimes I would just sing to him. Yeah, very nice. Sometimes I would just sing to him, and it didn't have to be a particular song. It was just about keeping a sense of balance and a sense of steadiness present in that moment. You know, and, you know, years ago after my father had a triple heart bypass and everything around was chaotic and Mm -hmm. uncertain, you know, when I arrived there to, to nurse him when he got out of hospital, you know, my thought was, I've practiced my whole life for this. Mm-hmm. Wow. Well, this, is, this is what I can bring. Yeah. This yeah. is what I can bring. I, I can bring a mind that can be responsive to what's right in front of me and what's needed and not be part of the trauma. So a protected mind, but very engaged. And protecting the mind often protects other people. We yeah, forget that part. You know, it's not just yeah. about protecting our own minds because yeah. our our minds are are living in, in you know, an interconnected relationship mm. with countless other minds, you yeah. know, and particularly in situations of discomfort or, or challenge or threat, you know. So by protecting our own minds and not being a part participant in the distress making it can actually have a a clearly helpful effect and this is the skill right people come away on retreats but going back as a social worker or whatever into the workplace and being able to take whatever you've developed or um, cultivated there in into living practice and i had a question around um concentration practices a lot of concentration practices um one of their effects is withdrawal, depending on what you're doing. So you can withdraw from the senses through concentration. You can, yeah. And I was wondering if that's a uh, a big part of your tradition, or is your those um, c- concentration practices that you know affect withdrawal or like the jhana practices. I wanted to talk a little bit about them if they're part of your tradition. I mean, I I did start in the Tibetan tradition Mm. and many of the practices I was taught in the Tibetan tradition had quite a strong concentration element. You know, using visualizations, you Mm. know, using mantras. Mm. Um, There's quite a strong concentration element within those. If you look at some of the insight traditions, many of them, if not most of them, have a uh, concentration is a difficult word. It's not really a word I I really am very fond of because I think it has that connotation of uh, being so exclusive and being so dissociated in a way. But some of the practices do develop that, right? They can develop that, but I think that a lot depends on how they're used. You mm. know, concentration practices can be used, uh, you know, against a background of aversion. I'll say that again. Against a background of aversion. Yeah, I don't want to be in the world. I I don't want to be with this, you know, and Mm -hmm. here's a more sophisticated way of disconnecting from that experience. 
And, you know, if is if that is the background, then I, I don't think it does fall under the umbrella of being wise attention, yeah. as the Buddha spoke about it. Yeah. I mean, you know, as far as I can see in the early teachings, you know, the Buddha didn't make these huge distinctions between practices. I mean, as we know, the Buddha was very light on technique. Mm-hmm. Certainly emphasized in the early texts the benefits of wise attention, which usually mm-hmm. gets translate or skillful attention mm-hmm. which usually gets translated as as um concentration i i prefer the phrase calm abiding mm-hmm. and i prefer, mm-hmm. prefer the phrase calm abiding a collected abiding mm-hmm. you know and it's a way of where the mind is able to sustain holding an object in attention mm-hmm. But there's an attitude behind it which is not aversive, Mm -hmm. which is intended to see this calm abiding as as one of the building blocks in a much wider landscape of inner development. You know, it's almost collecting the mind from its its habitual avenues of of dissociation Mm -hmm. rather than becoming another means of dissociation. In, yeah. So, I mean, it, it's kind of, you know, when there's aversion, it becomes another means of dissociation. As, as a skillful means, it becomes a means of collecting the mind from the pathways of dissociation. So this is an important point. And so could you talk a little bit about the difference between um, renunciation and this type of aversion? Well, again, you know, I think most concepts we use in the Dharma have got a near enemy. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and the near enemy of renunciation is dissociation. Mm-hmm. It's it's just actually turning our backs on that which we don't like or can't accept. It's mm-hmm. just walking away mm-hmm. from what we deem to be somehow not something we don't want to be part of our experience or part of our lives. And, you know, renunciation has been misused in that way over time and it becomes a a, a form of a kind of spiritual bypassing yeah. you know and, and I, I you know just let go why don't you just let go yeah. you know yeah. i i just need to let go rather mm-hmm. than i need to understand mm-hmm. you know and I, and I don't think the buddha ever used renunciation as a kind of command system of you know just let go it becomes another one of those cliched phrases mm-hmm. what are we renouncing that's a much bigger question, yeah. <laughs> you know. It's not about renunciation as, as a noun, but as a verb. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in, in the early text, as far as I can see, you know, the much more commonly used words are like unbinding yeah. or disentangling. Yeah. So we're unbinding, we're disentangling from the complexity of identification. Mm. And so renunciation, I, I don't think, is, is proper to use it as, as a noun or as a state. Mm-hmm. It's very much a present moment cultivation of, of understanding. And what we're renouncing or unbinding from are, of course, the very patterns that bind us to to struggle and torment in, in all its forms. Yeah, I, I often think of renunciation not even as a verb, but as a place you arrive at. And the way you arrive at that is through insight. So yeah. like you were talking about, through your practice and, and you learn about the nature of your own thoughts or the nature of uh, desire, yeah. then renunciation can be a place you arrive at because of insight. Yeah. So it's very similar, but yeah, yeah. yeah. Which is different to aversion or disassociation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then, so maybe you mentioned that you initially started in the Tibetan tradition, and so I was wondering how how you first came to Buddhism, and then how you ended up in a t- very different tradition than the Pastor. Yeah. So how how did that came to be? Well, I I rather inadvertently ended up in India when I was seventeen. And that's too long a story to go in, into. Mm-hmm. But, um, uh, you know, having done that long overland journey in the 60s, you know, through quite difficult terrain uh, mm-hmm. countries at that time and arriving in, in Delhi only to discover that I really found India a very difficult place to be in. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, I, I quite quickly... Um, 
fled in a way <laughs> as a teenager <laughs> to McLeod Ganj, where the Dalai Lama was living in a, in a community, the community of refugees there. And and there, 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 there was somehow just I was immediately at home. Mm-hmm. I immediately felt quite a sense of ease. And these were very early days where the Dalai Lama had uh, actually nominated just a couple of teachers to teach Westerners. And um, one of those was Geshe Rapton. Yes. And uh, after some persuading and coaxing, he agreed that he would teach me. And I, I lived there for for a considerable amount of time and, and had him as my teacher and along with Ling Rinpoche and the Dalai Lama and Trey Ching Rinpoche mm-hmm. and you know and Targye. So it was a very privileged time in many ways to mm-hmm. have that ease of access to these quite remarkable people. Um and, and there were not many Westerners there. Mm-hmm. You know, so it was a very you know, those were the days when you could go knock on the door of the Dalai Lama's <laughs> home and say, you know, got any time tomorrow, <laughs> more or less, you know, yeah. and and have access. So it was a very, it was a very privileged time. And, and I'm, you know, really forever grateful to these teachers for taking us on, you know, this, this, I, I think of it as the Dalai Lama's first great experiment <laughs> to see whether these these unruly Westerners could actually <laughs> learn anything. You know, they could actually learn anything, and uh, you know, it was discovered we could. And you know, it was a very it, it remains a very formative part of my whole my my own practice and the way that I teach. Um, you know, the motivations, the larger picture. Mm. Um, the compassion element being so centralized, mm-hmm. it remains a very formative, a very informing part of everything that I do now. But there did come a time when I discovered there was a quite considerable dissonance between the sort of grand ideals I had in the past and my lived experience. Mm-hmm. You know, there was quite considerable dissonance between the concept of compassion for all sentient beings and how I related to the person on the bus who, you know, just wouldn't give me any space, (laughs) you know, or, um, you know, so I, 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 I was aware of this quite acutely. So it was a time when, um, Goenkaji came Mm. for the first time to Dharamsala to teach a 10 day retreat. And I found that it was, it actually brought some of those great aspirations and uh, yeah, some of those great aspirations into much more of a sense of immediacy. How so? Like, where's the compassion in this moment as I'm hating my sore knee? Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, where is the kind of spaciousness and the long view when I'm caught up in this, you know, complex thought pattern? And mm-hmm. somehow the insight practices really helped me to land those aspirations actually in the classroom Mm -hmm. of my present moment experience in a way that they could be approached rather than somehow being deemed to be so inconsequential Mm -hmm. in the vast landscape of the long view you know you you know it doesn't really matter but actually it does matter Mm because that's what you live so i found the insight tradition brought forward that very much that very quite practical and applied moment to moment mm-hmm. um, cultivation of what I previously held more as an ideal mm-hmm. as a more lived experience so you know again I did I did much more training in in those traditions including jhana practice and you know various styles of, of insight meditation Where was that? And in India through yeah. Manindraji through yeah. through going to, through some of the uh, Southeast Asian teachers. And again, this this was really helpful, but you know, in, in my own mind, I, I've become less preoccupied with any particular tradition. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I do think, well, we know the disasters of becoming tradition <laughs> identified, you know, I mean, 
Certainly when I was first in Tibetan Buddhism, I not only looked down from my lofty hillside over the plains of India, I also looked down on all other traditions as being, you know, lesser vehicles and all of that, (laughs) all of that particular story. Mm. And, you know, personally, I, I feel grateful and feel to have benefited enormously from having the exposure to this cross traditional approaches because I, I think each of them kind of picks up on threads of the Buddha's teaching, um, which wasn't tradition bound. Mm-hmm. I mean, the Buddha taught pre-tradition, you yeah. know, early Buddhism was not <laughs> concerned with, you know, Mahayana, Theravada, and all the rest of it, it was concerned with liberation. And that's, yeah. that's a big picture. That's a big picture. And it seems to me that many traditions have, you know, specialized and excelled in highlighting certain threads from that mm-hmm. big picture. But I think there's a place in, you know, maturity of practice over many years where, you know, our eyes get a bit more opened Mm -hmm. to the vastness of the picture rather than isolating a particular thread. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is something that we're we're trying to do in in Bodhi College. Um, We're focusing on the early texts, the pre Mm pre-tradition teachings of liberation and and what the Buddha was really trying to convey in a in a teaching that was very radical in Mm -hmm. his time Um, and hopefully being able to bring that forward in a more focused and clear way through studying Mm -hmm. of the early texts um, in a way that uh, actually can inform people's you know day-to-day practice in a new light so Bodhi College is an uh, online course as well? Or? We're actually not doing anything no. online okay. yet. But this is a pretty new venture between um, John Peacock and yep. Stephen Batchelor yep. and Akinchino, Mark Weber and myself. We, mm. we kind of came up with this idea a few, really just a few years ago mm-hmm. um, and just moved it forward into something mm. tangible. Mm. So... At the moment, we're we're offering uh, a number of teaching modules in these early days uh, in Europe, Mm -hmm. in Europe. And, you know, we have no idea how this is going to flourish or expand or or be in in five years' time. Mm -hmm. You know, it it feels like we're all too old to actually start. It's like (laughs) having a new baby at 63, you know, and... Do I really need to have a new baby at 63? But actually, here we have a new baby. Yeah. It's actually born. It's yeah. actually it's launched. There. You've got to look after it. And now. now we need to to look after it. And it's it's uh, I think it's it's quite an intriguing and exciting venture. Sounds amazing. So, um, studying the original teachings and. Uh, in a retreat setting, is that is that or is it? It'd be more it? like study practice retreats. Our oh, okay. modules uh, tend to try to bring these mm-hmm. together. Okay, great. So we often have a morning of sustained practice and then an afternoon of teaching. Or in in some of our modules, actually, the teaching element is is predominant mm-hmm. and and there's there's lesser practice. But of course, the, the direction is to to bring them together. And you know, I mean. Some of my colleagues are actually some of the, you know, outstanding poly scholars yeah. of our age. Mm-hmm. You know, so there's an incredible good fortune in, yeah, in right tapping right. into that wealth. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I you know, sometimes I, I, I think it's, it's a critical moment because I, I don't see a lot of new, new voices coming through that are bringing together this, this vital combination of both you know, academic rigor mm-hmm. and applied practice. Yeah. You know, it's quite a rare phenomenon. Yeah, that's true. Well, it seems like the Dalai Lama's experiment is is paying off quite, is, is quite well, successful, right? What, it, what is kind of, of course, really interesting is that John Peacock and Stephen Batchelor mm. and myself were all in that early group. Mm, Get you wrapped in up there, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, wonderful. Well, I know that you've got to go off and teach uh, another session, so I'm going to be respectful of your time, and thank you so much for joining us on the Wisdom Podcast. You're very welcome. I hope you enjoyed the conversation with Christina Feldman. Next on the Wisdom Podcast, we have Kenchen Concho Gyotun Rinpoche. 
Rinpoche is an important teacher in the Drikung Kagyu tradition of Tibetan Buddhism. He is not only a great scholar, but also has many years of experience in retreat. So Rinpoche joins us next episode to share with us some of his wisdom. Get a chance to study with him under, or under his guidance like for three years, I thought I'll, be, I'll become a scholar. You, know? <laughs> <laughs> you already did nine years, yeah? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. But the uh, way he talked, the yeah. way he explains, so such a kind of it makes it such a great significant, yeah. you know, just kind of, you know, digging the depth, mm. you know, the, the word meaning, you know, the word meaning, mm. the stories, the, as a background, and then his, you know, different scholars as this, you know. He could teach all the different views. Yeah, yeah, views. And then I, I felt almost, you know, he memorized. He has, he has memorized. Yeah.